All righty, welcome everybody, and thanks for joining us today for our webinar. I think we will get started. Um, if we could just advance to the intro slide. Um, and I want to welcome all of you joining us today, as well as um, our friends here from Arcadia University. Uh, my name is Patty DeBow. I'm the president of Parsons TKO. Um, but perhaps most importantly and relevant today, I'm also an alumni of Arcadia University. And so really excited to be here talking with and, and uplifting the great work of the team, um, Rashmi, Rock, and Lara. Um, and so uh, we're going to talk a little bit about how they are uh, sharing data, collaborating, and really have come together with a, a quite audacious goal and roadmap for their Salesforce CRM and how they can really enable the kind of journey, um, sort of the full life cycle journey of folks from um, admissions through alumni status. Um, not only as an alumni of Arcadia, but I think this topic is really interesting to me because I actually play a number of roles with the Arcadia community. Um, so obviously, as an alumni, I get lots of communications from Arcadia. I also happen to have been on Arcadia's Board of Trustees for a number of years, um, and as a, a trustee emeritus um, on the President's Advisory Council at Arcadia, and so sort of have this unique perspective of what does it mean to hold sort of multiple constituencies within organization. Um, and, you know, I think Arcadia already does a really great job of, of managing that, but we're here to talk a little bit about how the infrastructure and data and tools and systems that you're using can enable sort of much more engagement with the communities that you interact with. Um, and so I'm really excited to have with us today, um, Rashmi Radhadak, Radhavrikshan, sorry if I uh, messed that up a little bit, Rashmi. Um, but Rashmi is the Chief Information Officer at Arcadia, Rock Hall as the Vice President for Enrollment Management, and Laura Baldwin, the Vice President for Marketing and Communications. Um, what I think is really unique today is having this really cross-functional group of um, executives that are collaborating together on uh, a roadmap for their CRM. And so I'm going to ask each of you to introduce yourselves briefly, talk a little bit about what your role at Arcadia is and, you know, the role you play in this roadmap overall. So Rashmi, if you would like to kick us off. Thank you, Patty. Um, thanks for having Arcadia um, join this conversation. It's, uh, it's timely and a lot of us are talking about data and collaboration and how to do more with less. Um, my name is Rashmi Radhakrishnan. Um, the Vice President and Chief Information Officer for IT at Arcadia University. Um, I've my whole career has been in uh, higher ed. Started as uh, in admission as a student graduate assistant actually, and then never left higher education. So <laughs> there you go. Um, and I've been at Arcadia since 2019. Uh, started here about eight months uh, before COVID, so that was very interesting times. So, um, and I um, lead and sponsor the digital transformation initiative uh, that is part of our Arcadia 2025 strategic plan. I look forward to the conversation today. All right, Rock, would you like to go next? Thank you very much. <clears throat> Good morning, all. My name is Rock Hall. I am the Vice President for Enrollment at Arcadia University and the Chief Enrollment Management Officer. Um, I've been at Arcadia, it will be three years officially tomorrow, and time has flown. Uh, Arcadia is my fifth institution uh, within the uh, wheelhouse of the university. I guess my job is to create um, student cohorts. And so I guess if there was an elevator pitch, I say that my job is to quantify, qualify, and diversify um, a talented student body and bring them to Arcadia University in the hopes of creating a legacy. So uh, no small task at all. So I'm happy to be joined with both uh, Rashmi and Laura in that endeavor. Nice to meet you all. all right, and Laura. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Laura Baldwin. I'm the Vice President for Marketing and Communications here at Arcadia. The Chief Marketing Officer, I've had the pleasure of um, being at Arcadia for 16 years. Um, and also working with Patty when you when you are on the board here and then with the President's Advisory Council. Um, I've been at Arcadia for 
uh, that amount of time, the first five years I was in international education. So doing the marketing for our College of Global Studies and uh, then moved to the institutional side. So I've been working at the university side for the past decade, managing communications, marketing, um, creative website, and the web experience. And um, my role in, in implementing Salesforce and um, really uh, integrating myself in as CMO, working tightly with the CIO and with Rock, um, the three of us building really a, a, a very strong trifecta kind of bond um, to implement this. So we're excited to talk about that today because it really is critical right now in higher education, that collaborative spirit um, and making sure that that when you're implementing a CRM, that it's a successful endeavor. All right. Um, well, before we dive in, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about why this topic was so uh, interesting to us at PTKO. Um, if we could just advance to the next slide for a moment. Um, so at PTKO, we are a digital consulting firm that works with higher ed institutions, nonprofits, and mission-driven organizations of all types. Um, and you know, we really focus on helping organizations get the most out of their technology and data. Um, we have a philosophy we call engagement architecture, which for us says that you know your outreach platform is a very holistic ecosystem. It is not just your tools and platforms, but it's also the people, processes, strategies, data, and types of engagement that you are trying to enable. Um, and you know, one of the things that I, we may touch on a little bit here today is you know the idea of selecting a tool, migrating to a new tool can be seen as a bit of a panacea, as that will solve all of our problems. Um, but you know, many of us know that that is not true and not the case. And so, um, you know, our approach and philosophy to this is that it's as much about the people and processes as it is about your tech and data. And that's part of why I was really intrigued by the approach that the Arcadia team has taken to this uh, roadmap that they're building. Um, so with that said, I'd love to show you a little bit about the roadmap that the, the team has built. And so we can pull up that visual. Um, but uh, I wanted to ask if uh, maybe Rashmi, you could start for us and just give a little bit of an overview of this roadmap. You know, what is the holistic picture of what you're trying to build to integrate, you know, really just about every department at Arcadia into your Salesforce plans? Thank you, Patty. Um, sure. Um, one of the first things that I was asked to do was to um, look at the needs of enrollment management because that's that's where um, everything starts <laughs> in a higher education. So it could be uh, seen as our front door. And we were using a really um, outdated CRM that was uh, hampering the work, not only the operational side, but uh, the entire marketing and the engagement strategy. So one of the first things that I was tasked to do was to evaluate the needs uh, and look at what would replace that. We took a slightly different approach. We, instead of saying we are going to look at a point solution that will serve admission or a particular department, we wanted to take a much more holistic look. So what we did was we had a session, a couple of sessions where we brought in stakeholders from the president onwards and had conversation about the vision of the university. What do we envision? What, what is our culture? What are we trying to build in the three to four or five years, whether it comes to uh, admission or our current students or our alumni? And what emerged from that is that as, a, as nonprofits, you know, we are all doing more with less, how do we still maintain that personal relationships with different stakeholder groups? If we all have different solutions and we have you know, not enough bandwidth to corral all those things. And that's how we selected after a very collaborative process, um, Salesforce as our engagement platform, because that's exactly what we wanted. We wanted that connected fabric throughout um, a student's life cycle at Arcadia. Um, so, you know, you know, everything else started from the point of creating that vision. That's fantastic. And one of the things that hopefully people are picking up looking at this graphic is the team has a really ambitious plan to integrate just about every department's data um, here from admissions and enrollment to active students and their both academic and non-academic student life data. 
um, your marketing, uh, outreach, operational data, advancement, alumni, fundraising. Um, there's quite a lot that's going into this over time. And so can you talk about um, whoever wants to chime in here, like how did you kind of build that ambitious plan? And then very specifically, how did you decide what order to work in here, right? You see, have a very intentional kind of order of what data you're going to bring on board first. Um, yeah, I, I can probably speak more to the why. And I think uh, Laura and Rashmi could probably speak more accurately to the architecture and the how. But I think the whole intent of this roadmap, as you said, was to create an enriched student engagement experience. I think the broad conundrum within higher education is this idea of how do you not only capture but retain student talent. On the front end, that's recruitment. We had to better understand the gaps. Rushmi said it best. Where's the data? How well was it kept? Is it accurate? You know, is it disaggregate? Can we bring it together? I landed maybe a year, a few months after Rushmi did, and very much the same phenomenon. Um, I say that I was very much feeling around in the dark, trying to identify data buckets to see where the gaps were and how to create stronger fidelity within those systems. I think on the front end, we've kind of solved a lot of that conundrum. We're attracting a better student. We're yielding a better student at a higher rate. On the front end, we have a, a lower attrition rate than we had in years past. You know, your first to second year retention is a good sign of the health of your university. Our first to second year retention has grown because you better understand the stop gaps and how students move. As we progress, the idea is to grow with Salesforce, understand it better, and then in a perfect world, as they graduate, they become those alumni like you, Patty, uh, who come back and give their time, effort, resources, and also create the legacy that we speak of within Arcadia. So the whole idea of the roadmap was this idea of being student-centered, uh, meeting the student where they are, but more importantly, creating a holistic experience from first contact to graduation. And can any of you speak to, you know, where you are today in this roadmap and, and just sort of generally how long this is intended to take? Because it's ambitious, right? It's, it's a lot of uh, not only tactical data, but also kind of adoption and, and change to support. So what is this going to look like to actually get to that, you know, number yeah. eight roadmap? I, I want to first speak to this visual itself. And uh, it will clearly say it's phase one because we are already shifting things. <laughs> um, so what we uh, this is our original uh, phase but i you know we knew going in none of it is going to be linear or end at phase one so uh, where we are right now is in um, phase five um, that's where we are not phase five step five but we've also jumped around in six <laughs> we've also gone all the way to eight like laura said in the very beginning started evolving and what you don't see is the college of global studies and so where we are at this point is sort of re-looking really at our roadmap and we realize that there is such a demand uh, that you can't really take a linear approach so we've taken a very much simultaneous and adaptive um, just a very agile approach to this entire scanning for opportunities and integrating Salesforce in there. Uh, but their roadmap hasn't changed too much because it was intentionally meant to touch about every uh, office at the university, whether this is their primary source of you know record or not. I was just going to add to that too, because taking that enterprise approach to it when we started um, was so instrumental into how this roadmap was built. And uh, I mean, I think it was visionary at the time because, uh, you know, we had to start with admissions. Uh, we had a CRM that wasn't going to make it too much longer. So the roadmap had to start there, but uh, really having that foresight um, allowed us, like Rushmi was saying, to to be able to pivot if we needed to, or go backwards a few steps if we had to, to work and learn and make things better. Yeah, that's fantastic. And I one of the things y'all had mentioned to me before that I, I would love you to share with the audience today is, you know, as you were the origins of this project, as you were sort of building that enterprise view, there was some pressing need on the enrollment side, but you actually went out and sort of got 
input um, from a pretty wide swath of the university community. Could could one of you talk about that process? I'll start and then um, Rock wasn't there at that time, but that we have sort of continued that sort of collaborative, um, uh, all hands on deck approach to this particular project, uh, including one of our very important grant work where we incorporated um, this work into that grant for student success. What while we were building this plan, uh, what we also know that uh, you know, like any other nonprofit, especially higher ed at this time, resources were going to be a major issue. So there was a lot of conversation about reallocation, but also how do we get started? I think a lot of organizations get stumped at the first steps. Like how do we get started? Because it's not a small undertaking, whether in terms of commitment to time, money, uh, just not just getting started, like how do you sustain it? And what we did was we took that as an opportunity to uh, engage other senior leadership and say, you know, this is not just about admission. The foundation has to be so strong that we can um, scaffold, um, you know, all the other areas. And what was amazing under our president's leadership was people came with not just ideas and input, but with the money from their budget. So it was truly a remarkable um, getting off the ground um, experience for me. It set the tone for how we're going to move forward. And without the input of uh, resources and other support from across the board, from the provost to different areas, um, we couldn't have got started. And Rock, we, we moved things around between admission and IT. We just built such a much stronger bond uh, because of that. Um, so, you know, it was an interesting story, but, you know, it may, it sounds in hindsight, something that is like great, but at that time, it's very stressful. It's like, how are we going to make this happen? So, yeah, the question of funding is is one you've mentioned a couple times, Arshmi, but I think uh, probably one people are very interested in. Um, you know, all organizations are cash strapped right now, and um, you know, I think through the pandemic, that has also been particularly on higher ed institutions an additional burden um, on people's budgets and resources. So I imagine there was a lot of work to talk about the value and the ROI of this project, you know, to get people to sort of willingly seed parts of their budget, which is kind of an amazing uh, accomplishment. So does anyone want, want to talk a little bit about like how you did build that that business case and, and prove that ROI to your peers? Well, soon after I landed, you know, I was asked to kind of give a broad assessment of where or what the largest gaps were. And, you know, from a data perspective, I think, you know, we had to better understand our acquisition cost and what it meant to acquire a student. I've often said that to recruit a student, it takes about 18 months, about $1,500. If you get it right, you do it one time. If they stop out for any reason, you have to then start the process to recruit them again while recruiting another class of students to come in. And so that push and pull on resources. That's the first thing we had to figure out. Why were they coming and leaving so early? And what could we do to change the trajectory of that? We understood that through some of the data disaggregation that year to one, one to two, maybe they just didn't like us. You know, for whatever reason, they wanted to go back home, wanted to see a different university, the fit wasn't right. If we got them to stay past year two, we knew year three to four, it was more of a financial argument. Maybe you always say a kid is one uh, medical bill away from dropping out. A kid is one car bill away from, you know, taking a break. And so we understood that part of it. And so then we were able to look at our financial aid leveraging model and package it in a different way to where we didn't front load aid so much to get them in the door and hook them, but we spread the same amount of aid out over four years and it allows them to endure and continue. So that kind of approach to reading the data, understanding the data, implementing changes to our processes in real time, I think that's what really helps us understand, uh, you know, the healthy ecosystem of the university. Ideally, you recruit them once, you retain them once, they progress through, they become alumni, they give back. Right now, I think within higher ed, and this is just my opinion, not the universities. I think there's a certain level of disruption that's taken place that's causing not only a paradigm shift, but also a shift within automation and technology. And I think it's difficult for universities to really stay on the front cusp of that 
But like Rashmi said, she and I, I mean, technically she recruited me here. And so she and I have a great relationship and immediately we understand the importance of connecting budgets. We understand the, the importance of knocking down silos, creating synergies, essentially stronger fidelities within the system to allow us to pivot in real time. I think Arcadia, uh, the, the, the biggest Achilles heel when I landed was, and I told the president, our relay time is too slow. Think of it like Uber compared to taxi. Remember you had to call a taxi three hours, wait, you know, back then you, you talk on a, uh, a telephone. Now you hit the Uber app, you have a swarm of cars within 10 minutes, they get to you. I've argued that sometimes it benefits us simply to be first and out the gate. As a small university surrounded by a number of bigger universities, it was very much a David v. Goliath situation. I think a lot of our success last cycle, we got out first, we got out better, we understood the data, and more importantly, our relay and response time was so much better than our competitors, even the bigger ones, it allowed us to uh, win the race. So I think collaboration in that regard is just you know, non-negotiable, it has to happen. And, and hopefully you have the kind of relationship that the three of us have where it's fairly seamless. Even when there is no money on the table, you make it work. Yeah, and to that point too, I think um, to Rock's point about being a small institution for us to be able to pivot together and to realize what some of the resources were that we, we really weren't accounting for. Some of that happened to be, you know, there's a learning curve uh, to a new CRM. There's skill sets that you need to put in play that go between, it has to be kind of cross-functional between the teams. Um, there were uh, times that we had to look at and say, okay, who's responsible for what? How do you build that as part of the roadmap? So uh, a lot of those conversations from the very beginning, although we had to start it for admissions, you know, the reality was we could look at it holistically and say, all right, how is this gonna benefit us in the long run? Um, and then how are we going to afford step three, four, seven, um, as we move forward. Yeah, that's a really good point. And, and the question of, of funding is sort of particularly tied to this one of ownership and responsibility, like you mentioned, Laura, right? Like, so maybe you can speak a little bit to like where you all landed on that in terms of, of ownership and responsibility. I think Salesforce is often seen as, you know, something the people who send email will use and that often can land in the marketing department or maybe the advancement team. Um, so, so how does that kind of governance work uh, at Arcadium? And that's a great question. And I think the, the traditional tension is between control and enablement, right? When you look at the, um, at the units like Laura and, uh, and mine, we sort of serve the entire organization. And while we want to make sure that we are streamlining those efforts and have consistency, uh, this is also not about control. So the approach we took at Arcadia was one of enablement. So knowing that somebody embedded in Rock's team are the most knowledgeable about admission who can anticipate the need better than they could ever do within IT, right? Same with, uh, with Laura's team So uh, and with student success. Uh, the leads, the functional leads are the ones who are going to make or break the project. Sure, IT is important, uh, you know, marketing is important, but the functional units, their leadership is incredibly important. And there is a lot of meetings. And you, what you also discover as you go through the process is there are stakeholders you never accounted for. And some of them are the ones that we need to bring in because there has been no conversation about data. There are data black holes and to create that holistic profile, you really need not only to bring data in, you need to people and process to be wrangled and brought in and have this conversation about why, how, and what the accountability is. So it's really a culture shifting process. It is, it is not, I would not call this implementation. If anybody has gone through an ERP implementation, it is just as intense. It is very um, turbulent at times. Uh, yeah, it was very important that we were um, inclusive around the decision making. And a lot of the decision making that you know we were looking at, it may look like it falls to marketing. Like, do we go with marketing cloud or Pardot? But the reality was it has implications with all of us and our teams and the resources that we needed. Um, so 
you know, implementing the layers that come with Salesforce also was something that we had to get through together to ensure that there was um, full workflow continuity and consistency as, as we were implementing. Great. Um, one of the things that you all did um, that I think is really impressive and sort of speaks to that enablement and empowerment of the end users is come up with a new model for data governance. Um, and that's actually public. So we'll have someone share that in the chat so you all can go take a look at what the Arcadia team pulled together. Um, but can you talk a little bit about like how this governance model came to be and how that's, you know, kind of enabling collaboration across the teams? Absolutely. I can talk about data all day long. So I'll warn you. <laughs> so can we. So let's do it. Too much into that rabbit hole. Somebody has to pull me out. Um, just like the CRM, um, the other urgency, there are a few urgencies, few fires, and data was one of those fires. And it was closely also associated with risks to the institution. Um, having the governance uh, became very critically important before you can even start a really good information security program. But beyond that, if you look to two years down the road, you in order for us to ever mature in the data analytics sphere, you really need the governance, you need the trust of the um, community. Otherwise, you can build great dashboards and data systems and the community will never trust you and won't trust the data and there's no point to it. We started our data governance similar to how we started our Salesforce project through wide stakeholder engagement. We interviewed about 25 different stakeholder groups individually um, and created this very expansive report about data assets, where things live, who the key players are, and then um, had a core group. So the way we are organized is we have a core group, which is very uh, representative of the major um, folks like admission, registrar, et cetera, who are the major contributors and, and holders of data. And we call them the data, yeah, you know, they are the um, core group. And then we also know that there are people in each of the units who knew the best and the most about their data and were, um, were sort of accountable to maintaining that. So they, that's our data stewards. Uh, a circle. And then there are people who actually interact with data and input data, but are not the ones who makes decision on the process and ultimately responsible for data for their unit. Um, but, but at the very top, we needed data trustees. We needed the senior leadership to take ownership of the, and accountability of the fact that they are responsible for the data security and the, you know, the data uh, integrity for their particular areas. Not that every vice president is going to go and look at what's happening, but they, they, they can at least know who the data stewards are in this area and be supportive of it. So it has been an incredible process at Arcadia where um, we have an incredible director of the institutional research, um, you know, who, um, who co-chairs this? So you know, sometimes we we bring people from other areas along with the IR to to lead um, the the process. Um, what what has happened in the last um, three years is we've really grown in our maturity, um, and we are doing our assessment right now to so move to the next such maturity level. But we've created data assets, data dictionary, and sort of been very very helpful as we move through the Salesforce project because we've added data stewards. We've identified brand new data assets. We've added to the data assets. And we can finally say that we now have a student 360 profile of uh, data. But if anybody's interested in more details on, on the governance, um, sort of how to get started or what works or didn't work, I'm happy to talk about that offline too. Yeah, that's fantastic. I, I think, you know, this comes back to the point I made at the beginning that, you know, the tool is not going to solve all your problems. And so both like this culture shift you all have done around data. And I really love the kind of very clear roles and the different layers of roles that you've identified for the folks that are working with data, whether they're the day-to-day -day users, the data stewards, or the, the executives responsible. Um, that, that certainly is going to enable something like Salesforce or whatever tool you're implementing to really give you much better information. Right. Um, I know that we have a handful of the departments represented here, um, and maybe we want to speak a little bit about some of the others, but I wondered if we could talk a little bit about like 
What are the biggest benefits or opportunities you see for each of the different university functions in terms of building this 360 degree view of a student? Um, you know, I think it's very different when you think about what does enrollment get from it versus advancement versus IT or, you know, student success teams. Um, so maybe we can kind of think about this in order of the roadmap and, and Rock, if you want to start and talk about, you know, um, what do you hope for for your team? Well, I think, you know, as far as where I sit, um, it's that classic conundrum of strategy v. culture and how do you have them kind of support each other. Oftentimes when people hear that, that catchphrase, that term, you know, strategy, uh, culture trumps strategy every time or culture eats strategy for lunch. I think that's true because strategy is kind of, you know, data informed. You know, you're kind of introducing a new idea, a new take, a new spin on something. So I think within this enterprise, within this effort, the hope for me is to have the data and the strategy help inform and shift the culture to make it better. I think within this leadership, you know, you're lucky when you have leadership like Laura that's stable, that represents the university and that has seen change come and go. And then you have leaders like me and Rushmi who kind of land and have to work with Laura to figure it out and in essence make it better. And so you have to marry that idea of strategy and culture together and hopefully create a, a, a strong um, alignment and partnership, um, some fidelity that creates scalable change. I think higher ed, again, is in this 10-year state of decline, declension, however you want to look at it, because we created these silos out of bad habits, turnovers in leadership, turnovers within talent. I think it's forced people to retreat and play small. The idea of strategy, new ideas, new data, new data buckets, dashboards, is to create transparency. Hopefully the transparency alleviates doubt and fear and opens up conversation and then you can become generative. So I know that's a bit lofty. I'm the SoCal kid here who's new uh, to the beautiful Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, but the hope is to create this idea of harmony between strategy and culture and create scalable, measurable change that is student-centered, that helps uh, create a healthy ecosystem within the university. That's fantastic, yeah. Sorry, Laura, go ahead. Yeah, no, I was just gonna kind of bounce off of what Rock was saying because working so closely, particularly with his team um, and implementing the CRM through the IT team, you know, we were able to really optimize the customer journey. So really looking at the user experience um, holistically and saying, okay, we were going through a rebranding and launching a new website at the same time. So how does a CRM, uh, how do we actually even test the messaging that we're working on? It was such an incredible tool for us to get to learn. Once we got past the learning curve, um, we could walk through the entire system and, and really evaluate the user experience of the brand from the very beginning. When somebody's engaged, we know that they're engaged all the way through. What was working? What wasn't? Could we pivot? Um, was this messaging working? Was it effective? Uh, we've never looked at billing before. How was billing affecting how people uh, were moving into the next level of where they needed to be? How were some of those main key indicators um, really showing through in the CRM? So from a marketing perspective, um, it was that, that ability to automate some of the things that we had been working on and working with the enrollment team on, but then also being able to say, okay, this is what we know. Um, this is collecting the data. This is looking at some of the behaviors, tying it into the website. Now, how do we take this data and have it paint a picture and tell a story, um, build an algorithm so that we can say, hey, this person is actually really engaged and we should really be focusing on them using Pardot and Salesforce. Um, and, it, you know, of course, this roadmap took time. And we did have to backpedal a couple of times, but the realities around my hopes for my team now are is that we're far enough along to say, okay, we have this rich data. Uh, the next step is really putting that into action and as and, and dovetailing right in with what Rock was just saying. And what are some of the things, particularly for sort of um, your current students, right? That uh, you're integrating all the student success content and, and registrar information. Um, practically, what can students expect to be different or see different in the ways that they engage with the university when they're there? So 
you know, I think, uh, I don't know if, uh, you know, probably the experience is similar. No one person at the university. So a traditional approach is one advisor, one academic advisor sort of, you know, is, is the one who contacts the students, you know, if there's an issue there. What more and more of us are realizing is that you need a whole team approach. You know, this whole saying of it needs a village. The thing is, the villages were supporting the students, but we never really articulated that in any system so we could track what was going on uh, with the students. So the what we took uh, was a very holistic, we call it the whole life advising. This is one of the other things is we, we actually married the foundation of the technology, the conduit of technology with the goals like with Rock or uh, Laura or other areas. So for student success, we, we started with the journey. So once, once you, you're all excited about bringing a student in, then what happens? You know, do they, do they carry that experience forward? What does onboarding feel like from a student perspective? Once they land here and, uh, you know, one of first year is one of the most difficult years for students to assimilate into a new culture, leave so many things behind and COVID has changed so many things. Um, that's where the student success hub comes in. The approach we took was before opening it up to students to interact directly, we wanted to make sure we had the cultural and operational pieces in place. So that's what we are working on. So when I talked about the data black holes, if you track the data black holes, it will take you to operational and people issues. And that, that's really where we, we start, we spend a lot of time in saying, okay, what is the outcome you want? You want the student to feel, to have the most frictionless experience as they move through the life cycle. And to create that frictionless experience are the, are the points of um, conflict for the student is that at onboarding, is it right before or is it through it all? And who are the key players? So um, all those things we are now um, actually enshrining within the CRM uh, and also tracking what we're doing with them, because one of the most difficult questions to answer, like Rock said, are, are retention improved. It is not contributable to any one factor, but if you don't track what you did to intervene, to make things better, you never know what worked or didn't work. So you're always throwing things at the wall and hoping that it'll work. Um, and we don't have that kind of resources or capacity. So that's sort of the approach we took. We are still in the very early stages. We are still looking at it from cohort to cohort, um, but uh, we've we've had to revise a lot of things and bring people in. And culture is big. I hate to keep saying that, but you need a willing coalition at the beginning of your project this complex for us to build on top of. So that's what we went after. We went after a willing coalition that is cross-functional to be the early adopters. And then we are learning and working with them to fine tune things and moving to the next group and the next group. And we will have to accelerate some of our moving forward, but we at least have the foundational data and a lot of the processes figured out. We think, I'm sure there will be some crisis. <laughs> yeah, and I would say in sharp compliment to that, you know, with the student population that we serve, we had to better understand mode of delivery. I think with the implementation of Salesforce, it allows us to be more omnidirectional in stance and approach. We can communicate via email, via a mobile phone, a good old phone call to mom and dad. We've created engagement um, spaces for prospective students, uh, current students, alumni, parents throughout the course of the journey. So uh, again, getting back to this idea of this ecosystem and how can you best uh, cut down on the relay time, I think this idea of mobility is really still in its infancy. As Rushni said, we're learning as we're growing. And we've been talking about this idea of, of gamifying the process in some regards. You know, when it comes to registration, you send out a, a blast to a kid and say, hey, five questions in under 60 seconds. You get three right, you'll get your registration materials. If you miss three, you gotta go to the office and meet with your counselor and really kind of incentivize and better understand students where they are. And you know, a lot of what we do, it is that classic question, you know, the carrot V stick. I think old models are kind of the stick. They kind of drive students to the end goal. I think with this idea of Salesforce mobility being omnidirectional, we have the ability to entice them a bit more and in essence, use the care to lead them. And we think that's a better journey and, and leads to better outcomes. 
I love that. Um, and y'all have started to touch on this, but we've got some great questions rolling in that I wanted to share with you. Um, so one that I think builds on what Rashmi and Rock were just sharing is, what are some specific things you can do now that you couldn't before um, in fundraising, admissions? Um, how have things changed or do you expect them to change as a result of those capabilities? Um, and we haven't touched much on the fundraising and advancement side. So I don't know if, I know we don't have your colleagues there with us today, but um, if any of you would like to comment on that, that would be great too. Um, I'll let Rock um, speak to admission, but with, I mean, Rock works very close, Rock's team works very closely with Laura's team. And uh, between, with that collaboration, I think our, capabilities in terms of, uh, like Laura said, automating and reaching students earlier, tracking what happens with the students um, is just many, many folds better than what things were when we started. Um, and same is true from the Student Success Hub. I was in a meeting with uh, a number of stakeholders from, from faculty onwards, and they said, oh my God, I've been at Arcadia for 20 years. I've never seen all the information on the student that I can act on on one given screen. And, you know, that may be anecdotal, but it is such a, a validation of, uh, of what the power is um, of something like this. And in terms of advancement, they are not on Salesforce yet. So they will be, um, the College of Global Studies and Advancement will be the next group to go on Salesforce. They use a different CRM at this point. So um, they we want all of them and they're very eager to get on Salesforce. I hope that answers that question. Yeah. And, and Matt, uh, I'm sorry, but to answer Matt, one of the specific things is our, our ability to automate our engagement strategy. Laura and Rock's team came together to create these campaigns um, and set them going, but they were also um, could intervene and adapt very easily. And the same with um, same with student success. Um, what it gave us was a lot of uh, flexibility and information at our fingertips, so we could act with more confidence and sooner. Um, we were also able to scale. Um, once we started to learn, we could scale more quickly. Uh, so we were moving from engagement studios into nurture streams. So when, you know, it, it, it's it's when we're not disqualifying a lead, but being able to build a, a stream to engage them and keep them active and, and actively um, looking at how they engage with the website, also social media, overlaying all of the things Rock was talking about that we send to them, surveys, all of that. It gives a, a, a really nice snapshot for our enrollment team. Yeah, that's fantastic. A um, couple other questions that have come in. One, um, Rashmi, maybe you can speak to who led this roadmap process. I know y'all spoke about it being very collaborative, um, but there's a lot of tactics in implementing these things. Who's overseeing it, facilitating, keeping the collaborations moving? Um, was that your team in the IT department or? Yeah, uh, I'm the um, sponsor for the Salesforce implementation, uh, but, you know, there's a uh very, very collaborative process. Like I would talk to the provost, I would talk to Rock, I would talk to Laura, um, and not just at the senior leadership levels. We had to go many, many levels and have that conversation. We had workshops uh, before we developed the roadmap. But yes, I, I led the roadmap process uh, with my team, um, working very closely with, the, with different groups. Fantastic. Um, and another question kind of more on this culture change and change management side, um, Eileen asks, you know, these processes take time to develop, especially culture change. How did you manage expectations? Were users patient with that process? And did people understand why you needed to invest in the process to get to the outcomes? So I'll speak from the, uh, from, <laughs> from always in a hot seat IT perspective. No, people were not always patient. Yes, it takes time. To set the expectations, we talked about something like a platform, how it's different from a modular application you would just buy that is pre-built with these functionalities. So the platform essentially takes time to build and mature um, and the Salesforce platform 
depending on how ambitious you are, can take anywhere between five to seven years of this, this evol evolution to really mature. And everything matures at a different time, how long you've been here and all those things. Um, did users uh, understand? I think what we tried to do was um, bring to the table what's in it for me conversation very, very early on. So as we did our discovery, there was a lot of conversation about what's in it for you and what's in it for me. Um, but it is still not easy. That's why I talked about the willing coalition, because sometimes people are just looking to their peers and saying, why do I have to do this? Feels like extra work. Why aren't they doing it? And by it, sometimes the message is much better when they receive it from their peers than it feels like it's coming from top down. Um, so those are some of the approaches um, that we took, but by no means is this easy. There were definitely one-on-one -on -one conversations. There were times when I, you know, I had to intervene and say, let's cool down, let's take a step back. Uh, let's talk about it because listening becomes really, really hard. Uh, real listening becomes really, really hard when temperatures are that high. Um, on that topic, are there particular lessons learned? Maybe we could do a little round robin with all of you. Like, what are some of your lessons learned from uh, from this process? I'll just throw a real quick one and then I will, there are many, many lessons. Uh, but uh, the first thing I would say is don't underestimate the time data will take from me this project. Um, so one of the first groups that went live was admission and they are especially tricky because they have a lot of outside sources of data, which would be similar to advancement alumni as well when we get there. They bring in data from a lot of different sources but not only once, it's, it's a repetitive process and we had to always keep it updating. So the data integration, having a strategy for data integration with internal and external sources, and I know this may sound very technical, but maybe not for this audience, but it's incredibly important that you, you have everybody understanding that you have to crawl, walk, run in this process. And crawling may look very manual in the beginning, and it is not that panacea everybody expected out of implementing something new, but that will come if we are patient with the crawl and walk, as long as we can communicate very clearly what the first phase looks like, what the second phase looks like, and the you know, multiple phases look like. So that would be my um, advice. And uh, I think that the time uh, frame is really important communication and making sure that we're communicating all along the process. Um, but my biggest advice really would be to be open-minded um, and to be able to collaborate. You have to let your guard down. You have to let the silos down and you know, be able to question each other and be able to ask for help when you know that you need it. Uh, because like, again, there is a skill set learning curve. There is um, decisions that maybe you made that you have to revisit. And, and that was one thing that we had to do as we got to kind of number three, we realized we didn't build in a lead component and we actually had to go back to number one to reset what we were doing. And it took about three months, but the willingness of all of the teams to really identify that, yes, we actually did need this um, and to go back and to do a rebuild, which took time out of this whole roadmap but we were open with each other and we were able to realize and make the business case as to the why and what the ROI would be in the long run. And I would say, you know, I agree with uh, both uh, Rashmi and Laura. I would add, you know, you have to, to a certain degree, program failure into the process. Again, when you have strategy be culture, both sides kind of know they're right from their framing. And I think Rashmi said it beautifully earlier, um, as a leader, especially, you know, when you're kind of viewed as high on the totem pole, I think your ability to listen dispassionately to people who've been on the ground for a number of years is key because those frustrations are them really communicating things that they've witnessed and seen before. And then your job is to better understand that and align it with the data. And within that process, things will go off the tracks. People would not meet your expectations. You might mishear something and go in a different direction as a leader. Show grace, show patience, commit to the process, get up every single time and keep going. You can figure it out. 
Those are fantastic lessons. Thank you all. Um, one question, because y'all spoke a bit about the timeline here. When did y'all begin this process? We started looking at, um, we started evaluating right after I landed. So we started this process around um, October of 2019. We, we decided to um, use Salesforce in the February of the following year. And then we launched the project right after COVID, <laughs> beginning of <laughs> April of 2020. Um, so that's when we started. That's helpful because I think, you know, a lot of people are wondering what does this look like? And, you know, you're going on three and a half years now and, and roughly halfway through this. But as you've said, you've had to go back and iterate and change the plans. So um, not not a quick and easy <laughs> process. Here. Sure. All right. Um, one other question that uh, someone asked was what tactics are now in place to deal with data quality and data standard issues that arise when integrating data from multiple divisions and sources? Who's accountable for this at Arcadia? Yeah. Um, Alejandro, is it like I'm hoping I'm telling you, uh, saying your name right? Uh, people kill my name all the time. So um, we, we sort of look at this as a simultaneous process in terms of data quality and data standards. And that's where the data governance, having a formal data governance framework was incredibly critical for us. Um, understanding how data speaks to different systems. We have uh, five main sources, but we have at least 25 different sources of data that actually have to all come together to create a holistic picture. So we were dealing with multiple point solutions in terms of integration, and that didn't leave anybody happy because my team is pretty new and we sometimes didn't even have the source code for these integrations. Um, what, what we did was we, we did an, took an inventory of all the integrations. And like I said, we did an inventory of data assets, the data quality and the data standard uh, for um, uh, in terms of integrity was, created holistic, I mean, pretty collaboratively by the uh, data stewards um, and the data governance committee. It didn't come from any one source. So, you know, after multiple times of meeting, people decided this is how we handle data. This is what the data quality needs to be. This is the standard. How do we maintain data hygiene? The integration is a whole different animal because you then have to say, okay, do I going to invest in these point solutions? How do you scale? your operations when you're still working with point integrations for all these different sources. So what we decided to do given our resources was to invest in a integration as a platform solution. And who's accountable for it? I think the data integrity, uh, I mean, overall I'm responsible in terms of chief information officer in terms of the data itself. Um, but the people who are accountable are the data stewards, data guardians, and data trustees. That's where our framework comes in. And in terms of the integration, we work very collaboratively with the source unit and the uh, destination unit in terms of where data is going. But we also have a data warehouse. So it's a very different question about who's responsible for um, data issues and who manages the integration. But that's a different question about data warehouse. Great, thank you. Um, and we've just got a few minutes left, so I'll ask one final question that someone shared with me via email in advance. Um, so when different departments, you know, I think if IT is the central owner of a system or the guardian of it, as you said, Rashmi, um, different teams may be asking for different demands of your department, and in some cases more than what you can provide, um, I think there can be a particular layer of some departments seen as revenue generating, like enrollment or advancement, and others seen as more kind of loss driving um, or budget using. And so how do you kind of balance that and sort of manage what resources go to which departments and, and make sure that uh, things are sort of, I don't know, whether equitably or sort of appropriately distributed across the teams in terms of how much resource for the project goes to each one. I mean, that's a, that's a constant struggle, right? Uh, we, we use our um, strategic plan and our institutional priorities as our North Star. So what, what is our priorities in the next 12 to 18 months? 
even if it always points to recruitment and retention, the players and the faces change. So it could be that it is still retention, but the focus is now on Laura's team. How do we now move up the funnel and use our application behavioral data that we never did before? What needs to change at that point? So it becomes about conversation. If there are conflicts, which it always is, because there are multiple people who want their needs to be prioritized for very, very good reason. Um, we have a, you know, a roadmap of where things are. And then we have this conversation with them as to say, yes, we know it's important and this is where it could start. And this is what we can do between now and then so that people are not competing with each other. The, you know, what are the things that are, sometimes we have to bump things off or list depending on what the urgency is. But often it, it you know, we, we have this whole uh, heat map of when things happen so that we know that where are we gonna put our resources. And then senior leadership uh, and the funding is another way of gatekeeping some of these requests coming as well. I mean, there's only so many things you can do with the limited resources. I, I was just gonna add to that, Rashmi, because we, we talk a lot to also about bandwidth and, and what the team is working on, what we're trying to do as an institution, the other goals that are in, you know, in competition with priority, um, but working together and being very open and honest about that uh, has really helped us kind of set some of those priorities that might come in that weren't expected. All right, well, we are just about at time. Um, so I wanna thank all of you for joining us. This has been a really fascinating conversation. I think getting some insight into uh, where you've been with this, where you continue to go, um, I'm just really grateful for y'all sharing this and impressed by the uh, collaboration that y'all demonstrate um, across all the departments at Arcadia. So thank you for joining us. Um, and for those of you that joined us to listen in today, we appreciate your questions and your uh, engagement here. Um, please feel free to uh, check us out at parsonstko.com. There will be a recording shared of this event um, very briefly afterwards, probably within the next couple of days. Um, but there's tons of other free content there, other event recordings, podcasts, videos, articles. So please feel free to check it out um, and get in touch with us if you like. And for the Arcadia team, if uh, I know Rashmi shared your contact info in the chat, um, if others want to do so as well, if people have follow-up questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks, guys. Uh, reach out with questions. Um, I'm happy to talk. Have a great day. Thank you. We'll be happy to connect on any kind of marketing or communications questions also. Thanks.